Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I believe this is week 22 of their never-ending experience with uh, a global pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm on vacation this week, and so I am actually, hopefully, will be in the uh, uh, North Carolina coast, uh, another state that is having some problems with managing its COVID epidemic issues. Uh, but um, I wanted to answer some questions that have, uh, that have been coming in from all of you. Uh, so, uh, again, I am not the all-knower of, of knowledge, and none of these questions are in absolutes. Well, some of them are. But uh, I thought I would uh, answer the questions I've been asked. So, one was, can I go to a religious service? Well, if you look at the data right now, based on the number of cases in the community and uh, our percent positivity and our, our number, all the things we've been talking about, uh, it's, it makes no sense whatsoever to get into a confined space with a bunch of people uh, and who are singing hymns. Uh, you know, I mentioned the, the outbreak in the, in the um, chorus the, the, that was uh, in a, a church choir and so I just think right now, uh, if, uh, it's very important to practice your faith. I mean, these are times when <laughs> the Lord knows we need faith right now in everything we do, but I think doing it as much as you can, either collectively online services or at home, uh, but not with a large group of people in a confined space. So uh, I would say uh, try to avoid any gatherings. Again, right now more than 10 people. Uh, can I go to a family wedding was another question I got. Again, if you look at the outbreaks that have happened, uh, they have been in these kinds of gatherings where we don't pay attention to the number of people, particularly multi-household gatherings. So we've had outbreaks in anniversary parties, in birthday parties, and weddings. So uh, I would definitely uh, not go to a family wedding right now until we know uh, that this virus is a lot under control. One of the questions we got is, are, are kids immune? Well, I think you pretty much know this now. That's been a myth propagated by, by a few people in the White House. Uh, but the fact is that kids are not immune from this virus. They get infected. All ages get infected. Uh, they have less uh, morbidity uh, but they are, and mortality, but it's not zero. Uh, and one of the things to remember is, uh, you know, kids do get sick, they do carry the virus, and more importantly, they bring virus home to other people who are more susceptible to the virus. And so unless we, uh, we st we've got to stop thinking about kids being a, a separate, you know, world. Uh, for sure, under age of 10, they seem to be the, uh, the least symptomatic, but there's still been some examples of this multi-system immune, res uh, immune disease or the Kawasaki-like syndrome. Uh, in, in young kids. So I would be very, very concerned right now about, we, don't, we just don't have enough knowledge about uh, kids uh, and it, whether they get sick. So where are the hot spots? Uh, well, we have one hot spot that we know about in our own community, which is uh, the Latinx community. Not only are they getting more viral uh, burden, but they've also had a higher mortality. If you look at, the CDC has been looking at mortality by ethnic groups and uh, it looks like Latinx uh, community is uh, four to five fold more likely to have uh, more morbidity and mortality. African Americans are somewhere in between, about three fold over Caucasians, but uh, that's a real hot spot. And then, of course, uh, there are states that are, uh, that are really having problems. Georgia's a, a mess right now. Um, and and I, th I, th I think the problem is that. Uh, hotspots will continue to move around based on the susceptibility of the population and the policies that the local governments make. If you, uh, if you still have virus in your community and you open up things without doing it cautiously and safely and smartly, you are going to generate a hotspot. So anything that you know, allows people to cluster in groups inside uh, with uh, letting their guards down, I'd say bars are probably you know, the worst. Uh, but other things, you know, uh, as I say, funerals, uh, anniversaries, weddings, these are all opportunities to have big spreading events. Uh, and so those are things we have to really, really watch about. Uh, I've gotten this question from almost <laughs> the first, a ton of people, which is, should I send my kid to school? Uh, well, first of all, we'll decide what school. 
and I assume it doesn't mean should I send them to Harvard or University of Texas. Uh, it's whether or not to send them at all. So uh, again, it's very dependent upon the community metrics. So uh, New York uh, State got their uh, positivity rate down under 1%, and they've had a very low number of cases, and they are beginning to cautiously um, start schools up. That makes sense. We'll see how well they do it. Uh, in the current uh, level of community spread in our community in Houston, I wouldn't send my kid to school. They're just, there's just no way. They should be online learning if they're you know, 10 and older. Under the age of 10 is a real problem because we know that social development is really, really critical to these kids and special needs kids in particular. Uh, what do we do with them? And in those cases, I think we still can't do anything until the numbers come down, but they probably are the first groups that I would start opening up to school. Uh, for one, uh, kids under 10 seem to have uh, you know, less disease, but more importantly, uh, they need the social uh, growth with their peers. But we have to do it safely, and I've talked about our plan, the baylor Clapman plan, to get kids back, uh, not only waiting till the numbers are low in our community, but things we can do in the actual setting um, in the schools themselves to make sure kids and teachers are safe. Uh, everything from how we mask, distance, put face shields, uh, to how we monitor and look at ventilation and outdoor teaching and a number of things we can do you know, one of the advantages of Texas, it certainly is miserable in August, but, you know, October, November, December, it's pretty nice outside, and there's plenty of ways we could have outdoor venues for teaching, uh, particularly for kids under 10. Uh, again, colleges, I, I, I think it's just going to be uh, very difficult until our numbers come down. I know there's a number of experiments going on. Some, uh, are, some are testing everybody in, that goes into the school and, and m keeping them in smaller groups. Uh, maybe that'll work. Um, I don't know what to do with colleges. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what to do. I think it's really, really tough. Um, and I, it'll be interesting to see the experiments going on. Some are doing all online. Some are ignoring it completely and just opening up school and, pretend, and hoping uh, that it works. As you know, hope is not a really good strategy, so I don't think that's going to work out too well. Others are trying to, to shift the kids in so that only 25% of the class is face-to-face is -face at any one time. I think the big problem with all of these is going to make sure to keep the teachers safe. I know a lot of teachers who do not want to be around 25, you know, 25 kids in college age who they don't know are you know, positive or negative. It's a huge risk to the teachers. So. I think that's going to be interesting. I don't have a, a, a great solution to what to do with colleges other than to try and do the best you can in, in communities where the, the viral burden is low and then trying to do very aggressive contact tracing uh, should you have an outbreak. Uh, I had several people ask me, should my kid play sports? Well, I think a lot of it depends on what sport. You know, the sports where you are naturally socially distant uh, tennis, for example, I think is a little bit easier than uh, dealing with football. Football, everybody's breathing heavily and imagine, uh, you know, a, 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 a giant fumble and tw 20 people are stuck on top of each other. I guess it could be 22, but a few people are stuck on top of each other, breathing into each other's face. I think it'd be very hard to have contact sports. Uh, and you can see the, the conferences are struggling with it. So. Many are, are just uh, forgetting the, you know, basically eliminating the, the conference play uh, for this year. And that's probably, unfortunately, the smart thing. Um, I have a, a, one of our executives has a, a son who is a hockey player. And they've been trying to deal with that by putting the kids in bubbles, a little bit like uh, what they've done in the premiership and what's going on in the uh, in National Basketball Association. And that might work, you know, keeping, you're testing kids in, keeping them together as a team. But you can see what happened in the Major League Baseball uh, world where they didn't do that. It was a complete disaster. So I think, you know, if you really do it right and try and have a, a contained area and testing kids and making sure they're in a bubble uh, and testing them regularly, I think it's possible to play some sports, but, but not all. I've had a lot of questions about uh, how do I behave outdoors with respect to masks. So 
uh, I think there's, there's two issues. One is uh, if you have a mask order for everyone in public spaces, uh, you know, everyone should be wearing a mask. But the reality is we've had very little transmission in outdoor spaces. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, the example of uh, a group that jogged together and two of them, uh, one probably infected another. But there have been very, very few outbreaks outdoors and that's really a consequence of how you get uh, an infection. It, it requires a certain number of viral particles that are, you know, that you breathe in, which is why a real contact is 15 to 30 minutes where no masks are worn and you're within six feet of each other. That, it, that's enough viral load to actually cause uh, this, uh, an illness. If you're walking down the street and somebody, let's say they're even COVID positive, runs by you uh, six feet or eight feet away, the dilution effect of having a few viral particles in the air is probably uh, insignificant. So I, I mean, you can go crazy about this, but if you're alone by yourself walking a dog or something, there's no real reason to wear a mask. But if you can't avoid being near people, if you're on a crowded beach, for example, and you, you can't really avoid being six feet away from people all the time, then you probably should wear a mask all the time. My favorite question so far is when will this be over? Uh, so a lot of it depends on how you define this. So as I tell my sister, uh, eventually it will, <laughs> it will all be over and some of us may be around to see it. But uh, if you think about returning to normal life, let, let's just be realistic for a second. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time explaining the R number, that the infection number. And of those four variables, you know, the number of contacts you have, the number of infections you create, how long you're in circulation, and then the population uh, sensitivity to the, the, the disease. The easiest way is if you get to the point where the population is no longer susceptible, uh, that's the way it really kind of goes away. That requires uh, either herd immunity acquired through 60% or 70% of the world's population getting the disease, which would be an unmitigated disaster because we would have millions and millions of deaths, or a vaccine which begins to provide uh, antibody levels that, uh, that reduce transmission. But, you know, it still takes, you know, you have to get to 50 or 60 percent of the population before you really get population uh, immunity. So if you look back, um, of course, history doesn't, isn't always perfect, but polio, which was devastating, absolutely devastating, when we had a vaccine, it took seven years to eradicate polio to the point where, you know, it's not a disease right now. So a lot of that's because you, you have to deal with the entire world. Now, the United States, we can, you know, we can do it faster than other countries. But if you start thinking about a vaccine in developing countries in South America or Africa, uh, you know, you have to be able to provide a, vac a vaccine that's viable. So, you know, it has to be stable. You have to have people going out there to actually deliver it, and you have to have people wanting to get it. So this, this virus, I think, is unlikely to be eradicated uh, anytime soon. But I think we, with a vaccine that's effective, or even with just effective public health measures, wearing your mask and being distant and avoiding things like religious services and family weddings and anniversary, doing smart things, we probably can return to a new normal, which is walking around with face masks and spatial distancing, but being able to do the things we want to do, like attend events. So uh, I would hope that maybe by the end of next year, uh, there's hope that we will have a vaccine by the end of this calendar year that at least is partially effective, that we won't even have the results of that until December. Then if you think, let's say we hope it's slightly positive or very positive doesn't make any difference if, if it's positive in that it protects in some way rolling that out will take another six to nine months because it's also right now the moderna vaccine requires two injections so it's going to be it's going to be a while I, I would i would plan on your life being disrupted at least until the end of uh, 2021 and uh, and maybe even longer than that so I think if, once you know that, I think once we all get used to that idea, uh, we can start doing the things that we need to do to return our lives to semi-normal, and that is 
wearing masks, social distancing, and when a vaccine is available, being sure to get vaccinated. And I remind everybody as the as September and October start approaching, we've got to make sure that we all get our flu vaccine because that is going to be a double whammy for all the hospitals and all the community. So anyway, those are the main questions I, I had the last couple of weeks. I hope I've answered them as best I can. Well, that's not right. I have answered them as best I can. I hope they're helpful to you. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I will uh, be back next week, and I uh, look forward to seeing everybody. Baylor College of Medicine is a special place. Uh, we should all feel lucky to be part of this community. We're doing everything we can to help the community at large deal with these very questions. We're trying to do the best we can around participating in vaccine trials. We've we're doing a lot of the testing for the city and the county. So, you know, I feel wonderfully uh, privileged to be part of a community that does so much. Uh, and Baylor College of Medicine is just a wonderful place. So thank you because you are Baylor College of Medicine. Thank you all for what you do. I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.